Good morning, everybody. My name is Sylvia Schreiber. I'm from the Combibis project, and I will navigate you through this Testinar, which is a merge of testing and webinar. Our title is, What can biotech do to live more sustainably? I'm very glad to welcome in our virtual studio six guests today. Um, can we start with the first slide, please? Yes, biotechnologies in our daily lives. Our guests are Nilo Emerancia. He's our expert evaluator and he's director programming Biobased Industries Consortium in Brussels. Then we have with us Dr. Rolf Blau from the Cosmos Project, Wageningen University in the Netherlands. We have Dr. Susanne Siebeck from the Chidotex Project, Fraunhofer Institute IGB in Stuttgart, Germany. We have Dr. Miguel Mauricio Iglesias from the Biochem Project from the University de Santiago de Compostela in Spain. And we have Wing Li with us from the P4SP Project from the Rheinisch-Westfälische Technische Uni Hochschule in Aachen, Germany. And I will moderate the panel today. We are streamed live and recorded, and the webinar will be uploaded on YouTube on, and on the Combibis uh, website. If some of you have questions, please pose your questions in the chat box with a written procedure. We will answer you immediately or preferably also at the end of the presentations. Before we start with the presentations, I will give you seven things you should know about the bioeconomy. Now I try to get out of the webcam. Yes. Seven things you should know about biotech and daily life. Biotechnologies are driving many sectors through green chemistry. The keywords are enzymatic tools, biorefining, molecular engineering. Using biotech can save CO2, can save fossil sources, energy, and can save process time. Biotech is the cross-cut key technology in bioeconomy. Biotech applications are in pharma, household chemicals, food, and many other sectors. Bioeconomy applications are bioplastics, bioenergies, environmental technologies, waste conversion, and many more. And the big question is, why does it take so long to take these to markets and to society? That's where it's all about in our testinar. And I'm happy to introduce to you Nilo Emerencia. Nilo is our expert evaluator today. He studied chemical engineering at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He worked in the chemical industry with positions in economics and planning, marketing, public affairs, and he has been active for the Dutch Chemical Industry Association inter alia for education measures in, at schools. Since 2015, he has assumed his current position as Director Programming Biobased Industries Consortium in the Biobased uh, Joint Undertaking. And during this webinar, he will provide feedback on market and development potential of the presenting projects. So we come to our first project to, of today, it's Cosmos. It's about turning plants to profitable oil side crops, becoming independent from palm oil imports to Europe. Our presenter is Rolf Blau. He is senior researcher at Wageningen uh, University. He has a PhD degree in organic chemistry from Amsterdam and a master degree in organometallic chemistry from the University of Groningen. And since 18 years, he has experience in developing technology to convert bio-based feedstock into chemicals. Over to you, Rolf, please. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning. Um, my project is called Cosmos. It's a Horizon 2020 project, and it's about two novel oil seed crops that could uh, really uh, play an important role in the future for, uh, for Europe. It's Camelina on the one side and Cranby on the other side. And in the next slides, I will try to explain uh, what we are doing in the project. Um, our main goal is to uh, reduce Europe's dependence on uh, imported tropical oils. And the most important ones are palm kernel, coconut and castor. 
as sources for special fatty acids that are contained in these oils. Um, and in particularly, um, these are quite short molecules compared to the normal um, vegetable oils. And Europe does not have crops that contain these uh, fatty acids, although they are very important for the European oleochemical industry. Uh, they are mainly used to make uh, surfactants, detergents, etc., uh, but also some uh, biopolymers and other high value products. So what we want to do is we want to turn these uh, two crops into profitable oilseed crops and, and secondly we want to do this in a sustainable way. So why is uh, research necessary on this aspect? Well, um, first of all the oleochemical industry in Europe really relies on these tropical oils. So palm, palm kernel, coconut and castor and there are no European alternatives for the the most important fatty acids that are contained in these oils. Um, and, and thirdly, the, the prices of these fatty acids, they are, um, they are varying quite a lot compared to other vegetable oil prices um, and they are relatively expensive. Um, and what we would like to do, um, we would like to use very special fatty acids in Cranby and Camelina that are not present in other European oilseed crops um, to make uh, medium chain fatty acids. So the challenge for us is to, uh, to bring the technology readiness level of, uh, of the, the different parts of the value chain from three to about five. Next slide, please. So who could benefit from the results of our project? Well, here you see uh, a scheme of how we approach the project. As you know, in European projects, you uh, divide your work into several so-called work packages. And here you more or less see the value chain starting on the left-hand side, uh, work packages two and three uh, with the oilseed crops. And what we do there, we, do, we use modern breeding methods to improve the, the fatty acid, the oil composition, also the yield of the crops, et cetera, et cetera. Then we take the oils um, and they go to work package four, where we try to purify the oils to obtain the special fatty acids that are contained in these crops. Um, when you have isolated the oil, you also get a so-called uh, seed meal. So the remainder of the oil seeds, and these are being fed to special insects that are able to also make medium chain fatty acids and they also um, uh, contain a protein fraction, which is very uh, useful to, as, for instance, as a feed. Um, once the oil has been purified, uh, we use chemical and biotechnology uh, conversion to cut, the, uh, as a, more or less, we use a chemical scissors to cut the fatty acid chains in half. And what we get, and that you see on the, on the top, uh, right hand side, we get uh, the medium chain fatty acids that we would like to have uh, and they can be used directly to as, a, as an addition to existing palm kernel and coconut markets. But as co-products, we also get other high value products on the bottom right side that can be used as building blocks for bioplastics. Uh, there's a, a special a polyamide or a nylon that uh, is made now from castor oil um, but um, Arkema, an important industrial partner in the project, would like to use European sources uh, to make this uh, bioplastic. Uh, we also can make uh, special biodegradable uh, lubricants, we can make uh, special surfactants, we can make flavors and fragrances, we can use some of the products to use as biopesticides and we have uh, a seed meal fraction and an insect protein fraction that can be used for food and feed purposes. Um, so the, 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 the users uh, are all along the value chain. So not only on the right hand side, 
but also uh, farmers uh, who are who can make a profit by growing these crops. There is the, the, the seed meal crushing industry that can benefit from it. And there's the chemical industry that can benefit from this. So all along the value chain, there are um, there will be users uh, who can use the results of the project. Next slide, please. Ah, this is uh, this is it. So thank you. I hope I I would I was able to explain in more or less layman terms what the project is about. Thank you very much, Rolf. You did it perfectly. And over to Nelo, please. What do you think about Cosmos? Is this a good future? Thank you, Rolf. Um, I believe this is an extremely important project that you are presenting here because it meets our objectives along one and one line. First of all, as you know, we, the Biobase Industries Consortium, in our partnership with the Commission in the BBI, Biobase Industries Initiative, we are out to maintain investments in Biobase here in Europe. And this objective is there to secure our future, to make it sustainable, to establish or help establish a sustainable circular economy and to be less dependent indeed on a number of things. And one of them is exactly what you're trying to do here because we all know that Europe is so heavily dependent on imports for anything that has to do with, uh, with uh, proteins and, and, and et cetera, the things that you're saying. Um, so this is a, a very interesting uh, topic for us. We continue to have in all our annual work plans, projects or topics calling for projects to address proteins and active ingredients. So this is spot on in this, in this, uh, in this area. What I would like to um, know is how about the supply and the supply security of the feedstock? When you talk about uh, uh, the feedstock, the carmelina and the cram oil, um, is this sustainable throughout the year? Is there any seasonality uh, factor that plays a role? So how do you, uh, how do you, um, cope with, with these? Is this an issue to start with? I don't know, to be very honest. Um, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Emerencia. Um, well, of course, as, as with all crops, uh, seasonality plays a role. Um, so we have uh, agronomists in the consortium that are studying the most um, the profitable ways to, to grow the crop. Um, for for camelina, a big advantage is that it's, it has a very short growing season and we are currently studying whether it can be actually an additional crop in the rotation schemes of farmers. So this means that um, in winter it can be a good crop to grow in, um, in climates where it's not too cold and it only has to grow for 90 days and then it can be harvested. So it can actually be used as an additional crop for farmers in their existing uh, rotation schemes. Um, for Cranby, uh, it, this can be grown as a spring crop. Uh, it is an alternative, for instance, for rapeseed, but it could also be an alternative crop for, for wheat. Um, and this does not mean that it uh, that it replaces food production, but it can be um, it can be um, taken up in the existing rotation schemes. So in this way, we want to prevent that uh, food is food crops are being replaced by uh, crops that are used for technical purposes. Excellent. If I may build on this last one, because this obviously is very important for us. And um, what we are striving for more and more is to have co-creation, to have food and feed and materials and make sure that we do not negatively affect the food chain. And this is ex extremely possible, as you know, more than anyone else, I, I, I presume. Um, mm. So this is, this is excellent what you just said. The other thing I would like to build on and from your presentation is what you said about value chain. Because this, the other thing that we see as a crucial thing towards the future is that we're looking at the, full, the total value chain, meaning starting from the biomass feedstock, even the cultivation of it, continuing to the logistical system to prepare it, the pretreatment step, the conversion, the downstream processing, the products, and the market application. But it is very important for us that we involve indeed the feedstock partners, in, indeed as partners, 
in the value chain. And they are not, not just suppliers to a bio-based industry that will enjoy all the benefits. So these partners all the way on the front end, I should say, of the value chain should also profit from whatever we try to set up. So, and I believe this is uh, what you uh, what you included in the value chain, that all these actors along the full value chain will will benefit. And this is uh, exactly what we're trying to uh, to pursue. Yes. Well, thank you. We're trying to involve uh, uh, all stakeholders um, uh, present in the value chain. So we have a an external advisory board in which there are members that uh, that are um, representing uh, um, stakeholders along the value chain, so that they have uh, during the project they can already uh, provide input uh, to the project to uh, to become as um, sustainable and and profitable as possible. Okay, and my last comment uh, is on the TRL. Uh, you are apparently at a TRL three which is uh, for us a starting point for what we call our research and innovation action. So indeed, if you can move this up to five, which is a pilot scale, that will be excellent and prepare it for the next step in our program. There will be a demonstration. So um, I wish you all success and uh, it's really something that we're looking forward to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for both uh, for this wonderful chat and very informative uh, talk. We come to our next project is Chidotex, uh, New Properties and Functionalities of Textiles. And the presenter is Susanne Siebeck. She is chemical engineer and technical biologist. And Susanne Siebeck is heading the group Industrial Biotechnology at the Fraunhofer Institute for Interfacial Engineering. Uh, her topics are treatment of renewable resources, lignocellulose biorefinery, enzyme screening, process development, scale up of fermentation processes. And today she will report on the project Cytotex. Susanna, over to you, please. Hey, thank you, Sylvia, very much for the introduction. So, today I would like to introduce you the Cytotex project. So um, we are aiming the development and production of insects, chitosan and in chitosan based functional coatings for textiles. So uh, in the next slide, uh, I would like to introduce you the partners. So uh, within the project, um, we are four industrial partners, three research institutions and four different in four different countries. Um, so you can see from the textile industry partners uh, like Dr. Petri and uh, Laufmühle. Um, you can also see some research centers. So it's the Fraunhofer IGB and DITF from Germany. And we have um, also companies um, like Protix and Eucodis and also a research institute uh, from NMBU in Norway. So the aim, as I said, is the modification of insect chitin as a novel um, and sustainable chitin resource. And um, we would like to produce some coatings, some functional coatings and formulations for the textile industry. Maybe just some words about the chitin in the next slide. Uh, why are we using chitin? So chitin is the second abundant biopolymer on Earth. And um, you can see the molecule. So it's similar to cellulose, but it has also some acetamide groups. Um, where can we find chitin? So they're in the, in the, in the sheds or in the skins of insects or, or in, for instance, also in crab shells. In the next slide, uh, I would like to explain you why we choose insects. So um, the company Protix, um, they are working on production of proteins from larvae or from insects for um, pet um, feeding, but also for um, feeding of agriculture. And it's an increasing market because um, they will also get in future also the regulation and to feed other animals or maybe also uh, for a human being. And um, they have a lot of uh, waste stream 
and uh, there it came from the skins of the insects. And um, here we start um, our work in a value chain, what is um, what you can see in the next slide. So we start from the, the, the chitin of the insects, um, purify the chitin, search for new enzymes, and, um, and then also make the modification of the chitin into chitosan with a special degree of deacetylation. And um, then in the next slide, you can then also see in the value chain that we work together with uh, experts from the textile industry. So we make um, further chemical modification of the chitosan formulation with different other um, um, chemicals and investigate the physical chemical properties and then also make the tests on textile coatings. In the next slide um, is uh, I would like to address the question why uh, do we want to go um, into the textile industry with the chitosan? So um, one aim is to use the chitosan as um, as a sizing agent in in the weaving properties. So weaving um, in of fabrics. And um, the aim is to use here uh, friendly, environmental friendly uh, uh, polymer instead of a synthetic polymer. And the second approach is also to find a solution of coating. So to replace the fluorocarbons, what are nowadays not that environmental friendly. And so this is the reason why um, we are working together with the, the chemical um, uh, industry um, that directly addresses the textile industry and also the experts on approaches for textiles. Okay, this is that uh, what I want to say um, for the Kytotex project and I hope to give you an overview about the project and the value chain from the um, insect chitin to the um, to the approach or application in textile industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanne, for this excellent presentation. Now I know where my future raincoat comes from. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you, Ilo and Susanne, please. Uh, thank you, Susanne. Um, what I like about this project is that you are addressing a market segment that is extremely important for us to move in, and that is the textile sector. Mm -hmm. We know from uh, studies and analysis from the market that the demand for textile and textile products is not only growing, but it's, only, it's also changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why we see an enormous potential for bio-based components to get into this market and help close the gap between demand and supply. So this is, uh, this is spot on one of the top priorities, I should say, for us in the coming years. And to underlie this, we, uh, or to under, uh, build this, we are setting up uh, shortly a, uh, a meeting and a discussion with the textile industry representatives. So this is also um, um, fits very well in our, or short term and medium term programming. Um, what I would like to know from you is at what TRL level are you with either the total system that you are showing or parts of it um, so that I can have a feel as to how far away is this from, from getting it up into demonstration, etc. because this is really what we would like to do as soon as possible. And also what I like is that the fact that um, this novel chitin resource is really bringing something that we are also looking at and that is to diversify as much as possible feedstock uh, processing technologies so it's a uh, it's an interesting thing but most of all it attracts me because of the market that you are aiming at so can you say something about a trl okay thank you first nello for the um, nice feedback so um i like this project also and um, you asked me for the technical technological readiness level so what we have shown first is really the application and here we are very proud 
to um, to see that uh, that this is applicable for textile industry. Then from the processing itself, I would say um, the, the 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 producer of um, the chitin, so um, company Protix, they are um, they are able to pr produce a lot of um, um, residues from chitin. So this is in industrial scale. And uh, from the conversion of um, chitin in chitosan, I would say we are in, uh, in the level of four. So um, we have done that in, we have done also the scale up and um, we are working now really in um, going forward in a, in a larger scale. So we are in, in liter scale or in 10 liter scale, and we are working on um, towards and higher um, pilot scaling. Okay, uh, this, sounds, this sounds very good. And again, I would like to repeat, um, this approach that you are showing is something that I'm trying to push our members more and more in, and that is to sort of backcast, you know, to go to the market. That's why we're, we're increasing our cooperation with brand owners. We don't want to make in our Bybase Industries Consortium with all the partners that we have throughout the industrial sectors, we don't want to make bio-based products for the sake of making bio-based products. We would like to make products that add value, that respond to a need that, um, you know, that, that, that there's demand for. And what you are, this approach is, 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 uh, is good because you're starting from a market where we know there is a demand, where there is a need and where it adds value and then sort of back gas and, and make sure that you can deliver. Um, so yes, please proceed. Looking forward to it. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, great. Thank you very much for this uh, very good talk about market perspectives of new textiles and bio-based basis. Very good to hear. Um, I come over to the next project, which is Biochem. I'm glad to introduce you, Miguel Mauricio Iglesias, as our speaker on the project Biochem, which is about waste conversion through novel processes. Uh, Miguel is a specialist in chemical engineering and food technology, and he specialized uh, in fermentation processes and upscaling, and he's currently working at the University of Santiago de Compostela for the project Biochem. Over to you, Miguel. Mauricio, please. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, well, we can move to the next slide. Biochem, uh, maybe contrary to the previous processes, uh, projects that have been um, that have been uh, discussed, doesn't deal as much with producing a new product, but with the way of producing or of designing new uh, bioprocesses, and in particular, uh, our main goal would be to design uh, a new methodology that would allow others to design mixed culture bioprocesses. And for this, we would use mathematical models. So next slide, please. So mixed culture processes that uh, you might have heard of uh, is the same as open, uh, open fermentation. This means that we don't have a given well-characterized inoculum, but that we would use an inoculum which is as broad as possible so as to contain many different functionalities. We want to do that because uh, these mixed culture processes are particularly um, well adapted to treating waste. So for instance, for remediation. And the hope is that by managing this uh, mixed culture fermentation that we are able to generate added value products. <clears throat> the main advantages of using these mixed culture fermentations is that as we are using an open fermentation, there is no need for sterilization, which uh, represents a large reduction of costs. Also re uh, related to the costs is that as we are not needing a sterilization, we can use a continuous process. There, therefore, we can treat much larger amounts of uh, substrate than it would be otherwise when we have a fed batch that we need to load and unload. We can treat complex substrates given that this, uh, the microbial community 
contains many different functionalities that are able not only to do the fermentation, but also the hydrolysis of complex wastes, the disintegration, etc. And that these processes tend to be very robust once they are well established, because as I say, the microbial community is very diverse and there are different guilds that can complement each other. The reason why these are not so uh, so used in uh, production, but more in, in environmental engineering is that the microbial community, as I say, is can be very complex and difficult to manage. That in generally and compared to uh, pure fermentations, they uh, they lead to a lower product titer, and that, that in general they rely on a previous experience of a novel, where experiences not available are hard to design. Next slide. So our idea, our idea in Biochem is precisely to address this, uh, the, the, the three uh, disadvantages that I have mentioned. On the one hand, we have uh, the VTT Research Institute from Finland, which works on the best ways to select the microbial population and ensure that the desired functionalities are present in our, uh, in our uh, reactors. The, our colleagues from Germany, from the Technical University of Hamburg, they are working with the ways to purify the product uh, during fermentation, so in situ uh, removal of the, of the product. Uh, this way we can attain uh, higher product titers and we can improve the economic profitability of the processes. And ourselves at the University of Santiago Compostela, we are developing mathematical models that allow us to uh, predict uh, what are the best operating conditions for a given process. Uh, this means uh, to uh, choose between different kinds of uh, substrates, uh, protein, carbohydrate, lipid rich substrates, and to choose between operating conditions such as uh, the pH, the residence time, or the temperature of the reactor. Uh, this uh, this way, uh, we believe that we are able to improve or to um, to narrow down the different possibilities that uh, are present in the uh, process development, and uh, and to uh, to improve the early stage design of these processes. I will just show a very simple example of this. So we move to next slide. So if we wanted, someone was asking if we can produce butyrate from a glucose-rich waste. So we have, uh, in a very simple way, we would have some uh, design parameters that we would need to set. For instance, which would be the pH of the fermentation, which would be the HRT, which represents the residence time in the reactor. And the question is, once we have set this, what can we estimate as the uh, productivity of butyrate, how much butyrate we would produce in order to know if it seems that this process can be economically profitable or if it's not worth uh, investing further on the process. So by our approach, we use, uh, as we can see in the next slide, uh, metabolic models that they would allow us to determine uh, metabolic models of the whole uh, mixed culture community that would allow us to determine what would be the target uh, pH and what would be the maximum yield that we think we can attain. This is how much glucose would become into our product, uh, butyrate. And this we could combine, uh, as we see in the next slide, with uh, kinetic models, which would allow us to uh, estimate which are the best uh, residence time and therefore, which would be the uh, butyrate productivity that we could expect with this project. So that, as we're saying, this uh, the development of this process in the in experimental facility can be very much facilitated by narrowing down the different possibilities of design, but also that it, there can be an early economic evaluation to see if the process would be uh, interesting. As our next steps that we can see in the next slide would be, uh, we are dealing right now, this project has been running for one year and there's still two more years to go with uh, uh, extending our uh, models to include also the main, co main, the main components of organic waste. These are the fermentation of proteins and also the, to model the fermentation of lipids. And we hope that by the end of the last year, uh, we can make a validation at a bench scale for uh, for a real waste stream coming from an industrial waste stream that we are selecting right now. 
our goal would be that uh, this way we can demonstrate and develop a virtual plant for simulation so that we can use our models to predict how the uh, and to simulate the these novel bioprocesses and the and that we can exemplify how this has been uh, used in a final design at pilot scale well, thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Miguel, for your first class presentation. I learned there's a lot room for improvement in the waste conversion processes. But our expert is Nilo, and I give over to him to make his comments on Biochem, please. Thank you, Miguel. I find it's another beauty what I'm hearing this morning, because one of the sub orientations that we took up in our long-term uh, strategy document, our CIRA, Strategic Innovation and Research Agenda, in our recent update last year, is system modeling. Because um, and this is in the strategic orientation of innovative processing, where we look at the pre-treatment steps, or at least we open opportunities for our members and everybody else to come up with good ideas to work on pre-treatment and on the conversion and on the downstream processing, but we added system modeling. And to me, this is nothing new, really. I, I pushed for it because coming from a chemical world, we model almost everything. And this is really what we need in this complex area of bio-based operations where we have so many variables in terms of feed processing, uh, the operating window, the qualities that we would like to achieve uh, and, and the economics to start, you know, not to forget the economics. So we really push for this and we have a topic in our annual work plan 2018. And we know that there's a, quite some activity out there in the field to work on this field on modeling. So this, what you're doing here, working on a tool that can help us in the industry uh, predict or, or vary and achieve optimal conditions to uh, to yield what it is that we're after is really uh, um, very high on, on everyone's list. So this is an excellent uh, project that you're on here. The second thing that um, I would like to comment is that indeed waste, a word that we hate, we use residual streams or whatever, but whatever people want to call it, if we can focus indeed in these streams that many persons call waste, whatever they come from, whether it's industrial or urban municipalities or whatever, wastewater sludges, you name it, if we can really have a tool that can focus on these streams um, and to convert them optimally into products that add value and still economically feasible, this is something that I would say that the whole world is looking at. So this is uh, also very interesting uh, to see this, this project as it proceeds. And of course, my traditional question is, can you give us a feel of to where do you stand in the technology readiness level with this system that you're building? Yes, uh, thank you for the feedback. And I have to say about your comments also that uh, we also feel that modeling is a tool that can open many doors here. But at the same time, um, I find many times in the sector that there is a certain reluctance to believe that we can model such complex things. That's also why in the project we are always trying to uh, bring together our modeling, but also experimental work, so as to demonstrate constantly that uh, the models are predicting what they are supposed to predict and to bring more credibility to the modeling approaches. As for the TRL, uh, I would say that it depends uh, pretty much on, on, on the kind of substrate as you have seen, I have divided, <clears throat> we have divided our work into carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. And whereas we know pretty well uh, what, uh, how to manage the uh, carbohydrates, mostly glucose rich uh, streams, residual streams, and not waste that you, as you have uh, corrected. Um, I would say that that we can do in event scale at the 10 liters with uh, with pretty real uh, 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 residues. So maybe we would be somewhere between TRL 3 and 4. As for proteins and lipids, which are also 
uh, keystones in order to be able to pass to real waste, we would be more more in the uh, Tyrol 3. So uh, starting with some uh, lab scale experiments and uh, try to run them uh, in order to make to have uh, consistent uh, results. As I mentioned, our hope is that by the end of the project, together with our uh, our uh, colleagues, we can run a pilot plan with a real industrial uh, residual stream uh, and uh, to demonstrate our model. So it, the hope is to reach somewhere between tier four and five, but I have to admit that this is uncertain. Okay. Um, may I suggest to you to take a look at our annual work plan 2018. The call will open in April. There we have a number of RIA topics, research and innovation actions that we call special RIA topics, meaning that we are opening the door for project proposals that could start at a low tier level, even from one or two. The objective is, though, to have and reach tier three at the end, at least tier three, so you can end four or five if you want to. And this topic on system modeling is one of those special RIA. And a few reasons for this is what you just said, that indeed there are many people out there who are very skeptical about setting up a model that could work in this field. And we've realized that. So we're, we're opening the door to start with, you know, very crude ideas in this field. And also um, the possibilities are there to focus with the model on a particular part only of a value chain, and then we can go step by step. But we are really very serious about this, um, this subject about modeling. And of course, part of the project should be that whatever one sets up as a model should be proven or should be demonstrated that it works indeed in real life. But um, we believe it, if we go step by step, starting at a low TRL, Ending at least three, we could uh, we can make some strides even this year. Well, thank you very much for the suggestion. We will certainly look at it. Okay. Good. Uh, wonderful talk. Also on what SX are still in the circular economy, which is a huge topic uh, in Brussels, uh, we know. But to realize this, we really need a biotech and models like a Biochem Project is working on. Thank you very much. We stay with the residues team and go over to Wing Lin. I hope uh, Wing. Jean, I hope I pronounce your name correctly. Vin, Vin Jin, from... thank you. Vin Jin, okay. Yes, you are from you. the thank you from the project P4SP, and it I should not uh, use the word waste, but I wrote it down there. Therefore, plastic waste degradation with synthetic biology. Please, Wing Jin, tell us what it's all about. That. Thank you for the little introduction. So I work in the project P4SP which stands for from plastic waste to plastic value using pseudomonas beauty to synthetic biology. So our objective is to take the plastic waste, namely it's PET and PU, to do a biotransformation from those non-sustainable plastic waste into another sustainable value added alternative material as like for this, um, it's bioplastic, namely it's PHA. For this, we are using our bug uh, Pseudomonas putider. Uh, in the next slide, you, you will see who are we. This is in consortium with uh, 11 partners uh, from the whole uh, um, European. And we have here universities, research centers, and some companies too. On the next slide, we have the approach how we want to achieve this goal. So we have different packages. The, ver the first one deals with the plastic hydrolysis. So we take the, uh, let's say for example, a PET bottle, and then we use enzymes to degrade them into monomers. And the second part is the monomer metabolism. So we feed those monomers, which are coming from the plastic, to our bacteria and then it will grow on it. And a third work package would be 
to do the project formation. Uh, for our example, it's PHA, it's in kind of uh, bioplastics. And uh, in the fourth package, you can see that we are trying to get the PHA out of our bacteria to then harvest it. So after all, our goal in the next slide is that we have the a recycling process. So we doing uh, bio upcycling, taking the fossil based plastic to do a bio uh, bio based plastic with and bacteria. And with those um, bioplastics we are using is PHA, we can pro produce uh, different products out of it, like this toposable tableware and what it is on my slide over here. What else we can do is uh, listed in the next slide. These are the process benefits we can also do in our project, or the, these can be done is to degrade a range of different plastics from bioplastics uh, to non bioplastics, too. Also, doing the recycling process in a normal conventional way, there are some plastics which are not recyclable, and there are some plastics which cannot be used anymore, and these plastics can be recycled too. Also, the, uh, the possibility to recycle mixed plastics. Also, using the biotechnology approach, we can also uh, produce more, like, more than just uh, bioplastics, um, like other value-added chemicals. As it's already told uh, previously, so here we, we want to know about the technology readiness level. In the next slide, um, our project is somewhere in between the TRL level three and four and five. So for TRL three, I can say that for the PU hydrolysis, so in the first work package, we are over there right now, but also we have technical uh, levels on five where we have the PET hydrolysis, which is already um, in a relevant environment uh, made there. And most of this is uh, already it. So um, in the next slide is our team. We are working with, together and uh, this is funded by the Horizon 2022. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wing Jin. Uh, you're a um, microbiologist, uh, studied in Düsseldorf, and currently you're doing your PhD at RWTH Aachen. Uh, just for me, uh, short to understand, you use certain types of microbes first to decompose plastic and then to recompose new plastic. Is that right? Yes, this is right, but we are just using one kind of bacteria. Okay, and then I over to uh, Nelo, please, to have the comments on this interesting development. Please, Nelo. Thank you. Very interesting indeed. And Next slide. Also... Sorry. Marie? Yes, excuse me. Yes, please. Nelo, go on. Sorry. Right. Please. Thank you, uh, Wing Yin. This is, um, repeat myself, very interesting um, for a number of reasons. First of all, as we all know, there's a lot to do these days about plastic waste. Here comes the word again, but indeed we have the soup and whatever. And lately, as you know much better than, than I do, there's a lot uh, information coming up about the ability of putting bacteria to uh, decompose plastic. Um, for these reasons, we have taken up this theme as a hot topic in our priority paper for 2019 and 2020. When I say our, I mean for the Biobased Industries Consortium and the BBI, the Biobased Industries Initiative. And we expect um, a lot of uh, interest and, and action to come in this field um, because there, it offers a lot of opportunities and um, it could solve indeed a tremendous societal problem, but also what we like about this is that you are putting in innovative technologies that we are um, increasingly opening doors for and inviting our academic members to bring to the party and scale them up uh, when you talk about 
engineering, uh, uh, synthetic biology, enzyme technologies. These are these are magic words these days when we speak for our academic friends and um, more and more also in the industry, we get very, very happy when we, when we start seeing what these technologies can do for us. And in, in particular, if we can start by putting these to work and attack and, and help us remove plastic waste, that would be fantastic. But we're also looking at using these uh, technologies for opening uh, doors to other types of feedstock that we have not been able to use efficiently or optimally these days. And these technologies can open these doors for us to help us diversify even further the feedstock base and increase the availability of feedstock for the biobase industry in Europe that we're trying to ex uh, expand here on an accelerated basis. So this, this project is, um, is also very interesting. I'm, and I'm glad to see where you, where you stand with the technology readiness level in the different steps. So also you, I would like to invite to take a look at our annual work plan 2018, but also uh, through members of BIC, of who you know to work with, look at as we try, as we start to set up our annual work plan 2019. Um, I, can, uh, I can almost lift the tip of the veal by saying that we will be coming up with topics that um, will opening doors for your technology to, uh, to play a part. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nilo and uh, Wing Jin, uh, for this uh, informative talk. And thank you to all of you presenters for your really uh, excellent presentations, uh, which I found very excellent, understandable for our audience, even not coming from the uh, biotechnology fields. And I think it opened uh, our eyes for future markets, for future solutions, and for a bio-based future as such, which uh, can help uh, tackle and solve a lot of problems. So I also thank you very much Nilo Emerencia for his fantastic comments and uh, his preparation to this testinar and all uh, have uh, taken some time to prepare and to share their knowledge with us. So thank you very much for your contributions and thank you very much to the audience for your kind attention. There could be some uh, time for some questions. You uh, could uh, type your message in here. Um, if not so, I raise a few words about Combibis because our project is coming to an end by the end of this month. And this was the last testinar in this uh, Combibis series of testing webinars. We had one on food technologies, we had one on forestry industries, we did one on marine, uh, we did one on smart agri, and we did with you the biotechnology. So the full cycle uh, could be demonstrated and a rich and valuable research, which is done under the umbrella of bioeconomy. We left your contact details of all the uh, presenters and also mine. Combibis uh, will end, uh, as already said, but uh, uh, the topic continues. Uh, Nilo always gave hints where you find uh, successor uh, opportunities and calls in the BBI strain and what the industry is looking for. And we, as Combibis team, are also continuing with two projects. It's One is the BioVoices project, which has just started. It's a mutual learning project with joining different stakeholders and viewing bioeconomy from very different angles. And the other one is the key enabling technologies Cat Bio project, which just, uh, just um, had its kickoff and is preparing its website. And we will come back to you soon with more information on these opportunities. I thank you all of you who have followed our webinars, who have contributed, and who look with us to the futures. Thanks again, and goodbye from my side. OK.